Welcome to Ask Dr. B About Music Theory. I have a question here from Chippy461. Now, I understand that this might have been a long time coming and you've been waiting for an answer. Just because you've asked a question and it hasn't been answered yet doesn't mean I won't get to it. I keep a log of all the qu great questions you are all putting in the comment section and, and hopefully I can get to them all, but I definitely read them all. So Chippy wrote, question, consonant intervals have consonant inversions except a fifth, which is a fourth. Why is a fourth still dissonant? That is a great question because it's a little unclear. It's almost as if the fourth has two different personalities. In medieval music, for a while, the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth were both used as consonant intervals. They, that, hence the term perfect consonant. And so if you're going to put the fourth and the fifth in that same category, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, the word perfect consonant in medieval music, um, that was the categorization. And from a certain perspective, that makes a lot of sense. Let me, let me illustrate what that perspective is. So in the case of a perfect fifth, okay, so let's say we are using the notes C and G. The notes C and G resonate in such a way that they produce a third note, what, what I like to call a resonance tone, uh, and that tone is a C. Not in the same octave as the C, but usually below that reinforces the C and G. And because it reinforces it, it makes it very consonant, hence the term perfect consonants. Now if you look at a fourth, let's say C and F, that also resonates to produce a third tone, in this case an F. Now this, I did go over this in one of my earlier lessons, but this is good to review because it's a really important concept. You'll notice that the F reinforces the F that's already in present. So in both cases of both a perfect fifth and a perfect fourth, we find that there is a third tone that is produced that reinforces one of the tones that is already in existence. Hence the term perfect. So. From that perspective, from that personality, they're both consonant intervals. They're both perfect in that sense of their stability. However, let's take a closer look. In the case of this one, C, G, that lower note that's creating the interval of fifth, it's the lower note that is reinforced with that new third tone. Whereas in the case of the perfect fourth, C, F, it's the upper note that is reinforced. Now, in this case, if we were to invert the C and F, do the inversion, that would be F, C, and the F would be the reinforced tone. This is really important. This is why the fifth is more consonant than the fourth. You can see that acoustics wants to reinforce what would be the bottom note of a fifth, even if it's a fourth, right, C, F, and C is actually on the bottom, acoustics wants to reinforce the F, the F that would then be reinforced, giving it more prominence, and the F would then be, if we inverted it, that, that, that base note for the perfect fifth. So it wants that, that emphasized. Now, this, this goes further, you know, and, and if someone asks you why does something work the way it is, there's a couple great answers you can just say. If you don't know anything, if you don't have anything better to say, if you don't know the answer, say overtone series. Chances are you're probably right because the overtone series is so fundamental in acoustics as to why things work the way they work. So if we look at the overtone series and let's say we just use our pitch C, right? That's our fundamental. That is our first overtone. I've gone over this before, so if you want to review and get another perspective, you can look up that lesson. But this is our first overtone. This is our fundamental. Now, after that, we get a G. 
That is our second overtone. Then a C, then an E, then a G. Okay, so that's our second overtone, third, fourth, and fifth overtone. So these are referring to overtones, Don't not to be confused with intervals or anything like that. Those are our overtones. And one thing that's really, really interesting, um, a quick side sidetrack, when I was recording uh, my Quiet City album, there was one, I'm in the booth with the, my, the engineer, producer, and, I, and I'm really upset that there's this one note, high note, that I play, and in every single take, it's a, just a little bit out of tune. And I'm like, oh man, that's, oh, that's a bummer. And my, I guess, I don't know, I was like, I guess, you know, there's nothing to be done. We, we, we move forward. And my, my engineer was like, hold on there, Dr. B. Um, let me see what I can do. And he pulls up this program that puts that tone and then shows all the overtones and the intensity, like in like a, uh, like a, almost like an equalizer format. And he looks at the overtones and he says, ah, this overtone looks a little funny. What if we were to just to like lower the intensity of that one overtone that seems a little funny? He lowers the volume of just that singular overtone. We listen back to it and it was 10 times better. It blew my mind. I had no idea that that was possible. Um, some people might call that cheating, uh, but I didn't pretend it was a live album. That was definitely a studio album. I'm going to use every trick in the book to make it sound as perfect as it possibly could be. So that concept of how important the overtones are in both the perception of sound and pitch, so both the timbre and pitch are affected by the overtone series. And that goes to show you how important it is and why, if you just don't know what to say, say overtone series why that's going to work for you. But notice something in the overtone series. The first interval is an octave. And then after that, you have a fifth. Why is the perfect fifth consonant and the fourth not? Well, in part because it's, it's in the overtone series, right? Well, you then can say, well, but, but Dr. B, look here, G to C, that's a fourth. I'll be like, yeah, you're right. And that's why it's a consonant interval. But look at this. C, E, G. That's a major triad. And that C has now been emphasized a total of three times. So if you want to say, let's say C, E, G, and now let me put that fourth here as an F. Is there any, any surprise that that fourth is going to sound dissonant? with the way that the overtone series work, because, and because of this overtone series, this is why we have tertial harmony. Big fancy word you can use to impress people at music parties, music parties only. Tertial, meaning harmony that is stacked in thirds. Right? That's why we have the triad. This is not some just Western convention that just happened to be artificially created. This is acoustics. This is the way sound works. That's why, why it's done the way it's done. These, this tertial harmony. And when you have tertial harmony, the interval of the fourth is dissonant. So when you go back and look at the Middle Ages, where they weren't really using triads, you can understand why back in, midi in the Middle Ages, the, that fourth would have been classified as a perfect consonance. But then when you start using triads more and more extensively and tertial harmony through the Renaissance, it grows and it really comes full-fledged during the Baroque era, that if you have this, C, E, G, 1, 3, 5, as your foundational sound of consonants, and then you put an F against it, even if you leave out the E and it's just the C and the F, that F feels like it wants to move down to the E to create a third. And that's where that distance, and that's why the invert, that's why there's that unique, almost dual personality of the fourth. It makes it a wonderful interval to play with as a composer because of that, that, that dual nature of that interval. So I hope that answers that question. Now I have a second question that's somewhat related. So let me go to Hassan Mafi, Mafi. And he wrote, Dr. B, thanks for being awesome. I hear a lot of, in the videos that notes want to resolve to other notes, like seven wants to go to one, 
or four wants to go to five. And I watched your video on overtone series, which we're reviewing for everyone, and the logic behind consonant and dissonant and human ears, and that was acceptable to me, to me. And I wanted to know the logic behind why, for example, note seven wants to go to note one. I mean, what if I wanted to go to other note? And what do I do with note three? Do I go to four, to five, to one? What is the logic? So, this is the beautiful thing about music theory. There's a lot of logic for us to like delve into. And then once we've covered and exhausted all the logic principles, then we can go and turn on, well, how does it make us feel? Turn to that. So we first we need to understand that foundation. And this goes into the, the idea of what, what I call tendency tones. Okay? So tendency tones really fall into three primary categories. So the first is scale degrees. And, and that's what, that's what uh, Hassan was asking about. Uh, or Hassan, I apologize. Uh, so he was saying seven wants to go to one. So scale degree seven wants to go to scale degree one. As that's a tendency tone. That is true. It does. And we're going to talk about why in a second. But before we do that, I want to go to his next statement, which he said four wants to go to five. That's not true. Scale degree four does not want to go to scale degree five. That is not a tendency zone. So I'm not sure where that confusion came in, but let's see if we can clear it up. All right. But then he says, well, what about scale degree three? What if I wanted to have scale degree seven go elsewhere? What do I do? Uh, how does this work? Uh, why does this work? So um, for scale degree seven, and that's, that's pretty much the strongest one. So let's say we're, we're still here. Uh, in this key of C, all right, well, so we'll say we're in the key of C, we have our B. Why does that B want to go to C? Well, looking back at our overtone series, if we're in the key of C, we know that C is just reinforced in, in just the, the sound, the timbre of that pitch, and that B being dissonant and clashing, C and B are going to clash. That's pretty dissonant, right? That if we can get... That's going to be very satisfying because where else would it go? Where else would it resolve if not to scale degree one? Uh, would it go, go to scale degree six? Well, scale degree six is not even a part of this overtone series where if we're in the key of C and this is our, our resonant foundation, and we resolve this highly dissonant note to something that's not in our resonant foundation, it's not very satisfying. It could be interesting, but not, but not resolution satisfaction. So, and, and, and then some people else might be, you know, if you're really thinking outside the box, you might say, well, Dr. B, why does it have to go by step? Why step up? Why step down to resolve? Why, why not a leap? And the nature of leaps are they, that they create some amount of tension. They create this space. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's why when you're, a, when you're a, a very small child, you're more comfortable making steps. And if you come up to a big hole, you might back off because you, you, you know that a leap, you're trying to leap across that. If you don't make it, depending on how big that hole is, you could get injured pretty badly. Leaps create a sense of tension. And that's true with, with you know, and I'm making an analogy here, and it might not be perfectly equivalent, but this idea of a leap musically, if we are strongly here, and I go, it gives it this, oh, a little surprise uplift. It doesn't sound like a resolution. And then we go, ba, da, da, da. And then we, we fall down a scale. And that scale just has this, this, this the, the stepwise nature of a scale has a certain inertia to it. Uh, the power of the scale is something I've used uh, as a term in a lot of my other lessons. And, and that's part of why seven really wants to go to one. Now, how do you break a tendency tone? Like, to, to, to Hassan's question, how do you, what if you want to do something else? You can. And that idea, that power of the scale or step inertia is a way to do that. So if I'm going C, D, 
I, I'm, I'm sorry, E, D, C, B, A. Here's that B, but I didn't go up to C. Well, I have two, you know, when I get to this point, there's two conflicting uh, powers, rules, if you want, if you'd like. One is scale degree seven likes to resolve up to tonic to scale degree one. But we also have the power of the scale or step inertia. And that, those two, you know, this power of the scale allows you to override the other tendency. It's that, not that that tendency is gone, but there's a more powerful tendency in place. And this is a great concept for you all to keep in mind when you decide you want to go break rules. That's a, another question I get a lot. Dr. B, how do I break the rules? And, and implied in that question is, how do I break the rules and not sound like garbage? How do I make it break the rules and have it still make sense? Have it still create an emotion for the listener and not just sound like random mess that people are don't want to listen to. So how do you break the rules? Well, you find more powerful rules. So power of the scale, that's a rule that allows you to break other rules. Finding what these other rules are, and we've, we've touched upon some of them. Um, so voice leading is, can be a very powerful rule as well. The idea of, of that stepwise motion uh, and that's part of the power of the scale. Those are, those are good examples of that. So another is in, in another tendency tone. This is a scale degree tendency tone. It has nothing to do with what chord you're on. It's, it's based on the scale degree of your key. That's one area. And other than seven, um, flat six or six in a minor key, scale degree six in minor, let's say C minor. So let's say you're at, and we're going to, Put ourselves in uh, treble clef down here. Let's say we have an A flat. That A flat likes to go to G. That's the tendency tone, right? Notice half step, half step. Um, that's your. That's a very. The half step is a re another real powerful uh, device in music. You can do a lot with half steps. So those are your, your really your two scale degrees that have tendency tones. But there's tendency tones that occur in other contexts. So for example, as part of a chord. So you can have a note that is a member of a chord that still has a tendency pull. And what would those be? Well, in a seven diminished triad, for example, right, seven diminished, I'll write that right there. Because of the interval of the tritone, which is built into that triad, so let's say B, D, F, that tritone right there, that tritone wants to resolve in. The B wants to go up to C, the F wants to go to E. You'll notice this is scale degree 7 going to 1, which, you know, so it's like the chord tone tendency and the scale degree tendency together, super resolution. Um, and here, this is scale degree four going to scale degree three, right? Not, not like Hassan was saying, scale degree four going to five. That's actually pretty unusual. Scale degree four to scale degree three, that's, that's pretty common, especially, but, but especially in the context of certain chords, like the seven diminished triad. So we have that. Um, and then seventh chords in general, like watch this, right? Here's my seven diminished. I put a G right underneath it. No longer is it a seven diminished triad. It is now a five seven chord. The seventh of any chord wants to resolve down by step. You'll notice that that's exactly what that same pitch did when it was part of a seven diminished triad. You have that tendency. Sevenths of chords want to resolve down by step. So there's an example of tendency tones there. Now what about tendency tones in terms of being a non-chord tone. What if you have a note that is not part of the chord? So let's say we have uh, our triad is, uh, we're still in treble clef here, C, E, G, and you have another note. Well, it, fa it falls under the rules of non-chord tones, and I have a number of lessons about that, uh, and I'll, I'll put some links to that in the comment section here so you can go and review as needed but they follow the rules of non-chord tones, which means that they have, must have uh, 
some kind of preparation. You then have your non-chord tone, and it must have some type of resolution, right? It's like a three-part process. How do you how do you get into the non-chord tone? Non-chord tone, how do you get out of it so that it doesn't sound random or like a wrong note? So it all depends. If you're if you're here uh, on a, a C and you go um, G F E, you say, well, look at that F. What is the tendency of that F? Well, in this case, you're using the power of the scale and you're going down. C, F, uh, G, F, E, right? Stepwise preparation resolved by step in the same direction, and we know that that is called a passing tone. But let's say we did something like G, D. This D here is a non-chord tone. It's not, a, not in our C major triad. How is it prepared? It's prepared by a leap up. Well, we know from the non-chord tone rules that when you leap up, you want to step back in the opposite direction, which is something I mentioned just a little bit earlier. So that means the tendency of this is to go down by step. That is called an appoggiatura. And so we have all these other rules on how to determine what the tendency, where a note wants to resolve based on what kind of non-chord tone it is. So those are the three categories that are, are, are most commonly found. And to, to get to the last part of the question, which is in, in certain respects the hardest, and here we're just going to make a little chart. We look at scale degrees, right? And again, scale degrees is only one way that we can look at the pitches. We can look at them also as members of chords, chord tones, or, or they could be non-chord tones. So sometimes it's not about where does this scale degree want to go, it's how does this scale degree belong to a chord and then where does that chord want to go. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but let's say you're writing a melody. Again, this is, there's, there's, I could do a whole series of videos on, on melodic writing and how, how tendencies work within that, but let's just map it out, right? So we're going to go one, two, three, four, I'll make a little more space here, five, six, seven, all right? Where does scale degree, degree one want to go? And we're talking about, again, scale degrees here, which is what the question was about. Scale degree one can go anywhere. It's, it's home base, it's safe. So you can step any direction, you can leap. It has no tendency, it's stasis. Scale degree two, where does it wanna go? Well, you can't really answer that question in isolation. It depends where did you come from? You know, if you came from Scale degree one, it's got a couple options. It could easily continue on to three, or it could go right back to, to one. Actually, let me reverse the way that looks. So if you're on scale degree two, you know, if it's, if it's this, you're on scale degree one, that makes a lot of sense. So does that, right? So sometimes, it's more of like you have a combination of tendencies, or you could also say a, 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 an array of possibilities. There would be some that would be very surprising. So again, like if let's say you, you had a leap, any leap is going to be unexpected, meaning not a tendency. Tendency is what's, what's expected. So if I made any kind of leap after two, it would be unexpected. It would not be a tendency, uh, a tendency tone. It wouldn't have a. It wouldn't have a, a specific tendency that's kind of like predestined for it. Now, some leaps are more unexpected than others, right? Some scale degrees will have more, more, uh, more tension built into them. If that leap is a dissonant leap, um, so leaping a third or a fifth, less, less unexpected than leaping a tritone or a seventh. So if we then go to scale degree three, well, where does scale degree three have a tendency to go? Well, to a certain extent, 
it is also in a consonant stable place and it doesn't really have a tendency unless something that came before it implies a tendency. So we talked about power of the scale as being one, one thing that allows you to break rules. The power of the pattern. If you develop a pattern or, or what's where it's more commonly called in music, a sequence, that sequence is another thing that allows you to break rules because the human ear says, says, here's a pattern. You then move it and your ear's like, what's that? Then it says, ah, it's the same thing I just heard, but at a different level. Your ear makes sense. And then when you do it a third time, it allows you to keep breaking rules. So for, for scale degree three, what, how did, where is it going to go? Depends what came before it. Did you set up a pattern? Is there a scale? doesn't necessarily have to go anywhere. It's very stable. Four, you know, again, here, it's really dependent on context. Like, if this scale degree four is the seventh of a five seven chord, it wants to go to three. So question mark, question mark, right? Maybe, depends. Uh, if you're going up a scale, sure, it could go to scale degree five. That's possible, no problem. Scale degree five is another one. Again, one, three, five, because of our overtone series, very, very stable. It doesn't necessarily have uh, a place it wants to go. Unless, of course, it's functioning like a dominant, because then it's gonna wanna go back to one. So sometimes you'll have the leap, that leap of scale degree five to one, and you'll say, Dr. B, you said all leaps. They, they, they create tension, and I'll be like, well, maybe I was a little hasty, maybe I wasn't clear, but five to one, because of this overtone series relationship, this if a G goes to a C, your ear is like, ah, resolution, because it has that dominant, you know, the dominant scale degree to the tonic scale degree. So there, you could say there's a, a tendency, but it all depends, like if that scale degree five is sitting on sweetly on top of a C major triad, it does not gonna have the same feel as if that was that that scale degree five is the root of a five chord. So again, context is critical. Scale degree six is similar to scale degrees two, four, two, four, six, all have similar, like depends on where you're going, a scale. Scale degree seven, we know we covered. That's one that definitely has a ten is, is, is definitely a true tendency tone in terms of wanting to resolve to one. You'll notice that seven is not part of this overtone series. Uh, it, it, it doesn't happen until much higher, many more steps up in the overtone series. Um, again, in the overtone series gets a little bit unusual after this point in terms of it, it tuning to Western equal temperament tuning. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but that, that, in a certain sense, is a, a, is a terrible answer or a completely unuseful answer where some, you know, and, and this is when music, this more than one music student, I'm sure, has heard this, you know, professor, what should I do? And the professor says, well, whatever feels right, which is completely not helpful <laughs> because if you have not acquired good taste, see my previous video, how do you know what feels right? Like your feelings, you know, sometimes we've all had a moment in our life where we felt something and we realized in retrospect that, oh, we were, we felt that way, but yeah, it, we weren't right. We made a mistake and we have to apologize because we went on, you know, we did, we don't buy our feelings and yeah, we, we didn't, we didn't see the big picture and we were just, you know, being a little hot headed. So, so this, you know, how scale degrees are going to work. And, to, and where you can go, um, really, the, there's there's so many possibilities. It can be a little bit overwhelming, and so this is one reason why, um, in terms of music theory, uh, the focus is very often more on harmony than anything else. Because you could say, well, let's look at the chords, and chords are are much clearer on where they want to go. Scale degrees have so many possibilities, and if you look at most traditional music theory. Um, books, they're going to talk a ton, a ton about harmony, right? And they're going to, you're, you're going to know so much about harmony, you're going to be a master. They're only going to talk a very little bit about melody. 
and a even smaller amount usually about rhythm. Melody and rhythm have been shortchanged in most music theory texts and the emphasis has been on harmony. And part of the reason for that is because the number of possibilities for both melody and rhythm are just so large, but more so for melody. The possibilities for mel melody are just so numerous because they don't necessarily have to do anything. There's so many possibilities so that it becomes hard and probably the best way to study melody is to uh, acquire good taste by listening and analyzing good melodies that have been written by the masters that have come before us. And that might be a wonderful video for some time in the future. But until then, best wishes, Dr. B.